We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and the 2023 Formula One season has finally come to an end. Finally, thank you. It happened. I'm so over it. Let's move on. 2024. I know you are. (laughs) The asterisk season that I will never be okay with, but you know, whatever. It's fine. The the Max Verstappen domination, other than that one race that Carlos Ice won, is done. It's done. Dumb, dumb we have we have we have we have three months off from the Dutch national anthem, um, and hopefully in that time, some other teams will develop their cars to at least give uh, Red Bull something to fight against. Honestly, as much as I hated this season, it was very impressive the performance from Red Bull and Max Verstappen, and I'm really interested to see how the uh, first race of the season goes next year just to see who comes around or if Red Bull is just going to continue their domination. So either way, it'll be super exciting to see uh, the 2024 season. I'm very, very excited to get to racing yeah. again, even though we just ended, but it's a long yeah. break. So. As uh, as the the noted Red Bull and Max Verstappen fan of the of the podcast, and also as a statistician who just really likes stats and records, I did enjoy the season just from like the the breaking of records standpoint and the record book updating. Like as when I was back when I was a statistician working in college sports, my favorite thing would always be having the record book next to me so that I can make updates throughout the year. Um, unfortunately, I was in a position where the teams that I was working with had a lot of records that needed to be updated. So from a a statistician standpoint, I did enjoy that. Um, Even though I understand that if you're not a Red Bull and Max Verstappen fan, this is probably a little bit of a boring year for you. Yeah, but I still, I like, I agree with what you were saying. Like, it's still exciting to see records broken and to see a driver do stuff that no driver has ever done before. Um, From that aspect, it is exciting to see in the sport, even if it's not, you know, my team and my driver that I'm rooting for. But like I've always said, you know, you have to recognize and give him credit that he is an amazing driver. So yeah, I will do that. But uh, yeah, well, and what was it? I think on the radio call, Max was like, GP, we did it. Mission eight accomplished, which I'm guessing they had like eight milestones this season that they saw in their heads. But this one had to be the thousand laps in the season. Probably, yeah. I mean, and, and that one was like that one was close. Like I I was I was watching through the entire race and be like, my dad texted me at one point, he's like, has he done it yet? And I'm like, no, no, he needs 49. Um, well, and I'm like so... sitting there trying to do fast math in my head and I'm like, okay, where is he at? How many? So it was pretty yeah. crazy. And I'm just like, wait, how many laps did Yuki lead? How many laps do we have now? How many laps did did Max lead before he went to pit? Like it, it was it was so much math. Um, but I think they, that, you know, it it doesn't mean much in the grand scheme of of Formula One no. because this was such so much of a longer season um, compared to you know the the early years, the Michael Schumacher days, even the the you know the early days of Lewis Hamilton. Um, the the calendar was not this long. Um, oh, I've, I've got my TV on in the background, and they're showing um, highlights from from this morning's race on Sports Center. Anyway, um, but it's 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 one of those feats. It's like. It's cool that it happened because the likelihood of it happening again is is slimmer. Um, and the fact that he made it to a thousand is like that's a very round milestone rather than like nine hundred ninety seven laps. Oh, for sure. And it's something to keep in mind too is this is a season technically with two races that we were supposed to have and we didn't because China Correct. didn't happen and. Um, Emily Emilia Romagna. Yeah. So it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah. So, so the final count, and thank you to to Sports Center behind my television or behind my computer, is um the most laps led in a season is one thousand and three laps led. Look at him go. He got that three. <laughs> he did, he did. Well, we've kind of already started, but let's uh you think we're ready to get into our hot lap recap? Might as well, since we did already start talking about it. We 
just went right for it. Well, let's jump into our hot lap recap for the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Yeah, so Max Verstappen, as we said, he did Max things. He won race 19. Um, Red Bull has has won 21 of 22 races, uh, thanks to the two wins from Perez earlier this year. And then, of course, Carlos had the other one, and he did become the first driver to lead 1,000 laps in the season. Um, and he's got 19 wins. There are 19 drivers who have led 1,000 laps in their entire careers, which Max did in one. Yeah, that's... Not like I mean this in the best of ways. He's a freak of nature. Yeah, absolutely. Like that's it is incredible, and you have to tip your hat to him. He had a record breaking, record shattering season. So, congratulations, Max. <laughs> um, congratulations also goes out to Mercedes. Unfortunately, um, they were able to hold off Charles Leclerc and Ferrari. Um, to end up in P2 for the Constructors' Championship um, with special thanks to George's P3 finish and, you know, Lewis's lackluster race of landing in P9. But unfortunately, they were able to withstand the attack from Ferrari and whatever their strategy was today. So congrats. We'll get into that. Oh, my God. Yeah. And I, I, I personally really did not see this coming. Um, but Fernando Alonso, um, he finished P seven, which was enough for him to secure P four in the driver's championship. And he was one of the four drivers in the mix for P four. I just based on, on what Aston Martin had done the second half of the year, I really didn't think it was going to happen. Um, but on count backs, it did. Yeah. That was a surprise to me as well, but huge congrats to, uh, Fernando Alonso. I feel like we're just congratulating everyone in our hot lap recap. Many, Apparently. Many positives today. Um, Yuki Tsunoda took driver of the day today at the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. And that, you know, was kind of a really nice send off to um, Franz, their, sorry, um, their team principal. <laughs> Thank you. Words are hard. Team principal. Um, he's retiring. This was his last season, his last race. Um, so a good good finish for Yuki today and a good finish for Franz with his really storied career with um, now AlphaTauri. Yeah, he, he he had been there for forever. They they really tried. Re- they they fought hard to to get Alfatari to overtake Williams in the in the constructors. Um, they missed it by three points. It was we were like willing it to happen. Um, unfortunately, it didn't. But it, it was still a lot more than Alfatari expected going into the summer break. I think we can we can say that for with confidence. No, definitely they definitely turned the season around, which was good for them. Yeah. So diving back into talking about Max Verstappen, this seems to be um, a like theme. we said, all we do is talk about Max Verstappen. Ugh. Yeah, something about him winning all of the almost all of the races. He's won 19. This is his 54th career win, which officially puts him in um, third place all time by himself, um, behind Lewis Hamilton with 103 victories and Michael Schumacher with 91. Um, he's broken about a million records this season, which we will go into in our season recap, um, so that we don't bog down the entire Abu Dhabi recap. Um, and um, along with in, um, surpassing that thousand lap milestone, Max is now at uh, 2,858 laps led in his career. So he will very likely make it to 3,000 laps led sometime early in 2024 if things go the way I think that we're expecting that they go with, with next year's Red Bull car, the what, RB20. Blah, blah, blah. Max is good. Max drives fast. <laughs> yes. But it, let, let's move on to uh, Charles Leclerc, the lead strategist for oh Ferrari. God. Oh, my God. I can't with Ferrari. They have turned their drivers into their own strategists at this point, which, like, good for them. But clearly, things are going awry. Um, Charles did drive really well today, I think. And I think he had, a, like, you know, what Catherine's saying, the lead strategist, really good idea of saying, okay, I'm going to slow down, let Checo pass, and then he can go and I'll, you know, keep defending George to try and get the five-second penalty to affect George because Checo did have a five-second penalty at the end of the race. Um, unfortunately, George was only 3.8 like, seconds behind Checo, so he did end up in P3. 
but Charles was really trying to be a you know team player for the team to make sure that they could secure the P2 and the constructors. Ultimately, they did not, but good thinking. He did give up the second place official finish, let's say, um, to let Checo pass, but well, uh, he he knew he knew he was going to get that that anyway. Right, right. Um, he there, knew he could stay within five seconds and and everything like that. But just to have the idea to like drop back, let him pass. Um, you know, normally yeah. that would come from your strategist, but here at Ferrari, we don't do that. Comes from we your just drivers. Have our drivers give a good strategy. Yeah, unfortunately, it was also a little bit moot because Lewis had a late overtake, so he had been running in P10, and if he, he was running in P10, and Checo managed to to get five seconds of a gap between himself and George, that would have kept George in P4, um, which would have given Ferrari, um, I think, on tie break. Um, because they have a win and Mercedes doesn't, that would have given them P2 in the constructors, but George got a late overtake um, and um, Checo just didn't have, they just didn't have enough time no, um, to, for like Checo to build that gap. Laps, yeah. One or two more laps. I think it would have been able, they would have been able to do it and pull it off, but yeah. Yeah. And then, and then George, who has said that this was probably one of his worst seasons of his career, managed to finish on a podium and helped Mercedes maintain P2, which I don't really think that anyone expected Mercedes to hold on to P2 with the way they no. performed this latter half of the year. No, not at all. But I feel like, again, speaking of Mercedes, they were all sneaky points because I feel like Mercedes oh, always. was not, you know, doing amazing. I, You know, Lewis ended up on the podium a handful of times. George did George things, mostly just complaining, but um <laughs> we all know you're not wrong feels that, how emily feels about george um but for them to be in p2 is wild to me yeah ab- absolutely they just they're so and I, I talk about this all the time they're so sneaky with the way that they grab those p4s those p5s those p6s um and they grab them in bunches but you don't talk about it because you have other things happening like max winning a million races you have yeah. aston martin doing what aston martin did the first half of the season um you have mclaren's amazing comeback and mercedes was just they were to their credit they were so consistent even though they were not consistent in the way that Mercedes expects Mercedes to be consistent at the front of the grid. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's just, it really shows you how important those uh, P5, P6, P7 finishes are instead of, you know, not starting or DNFing in the uh, disqualification lap. So, you know, Ferrari had a few of those moments well mercedes didn't quite have as many of those so you know that'll happen that'll happen yeah. but george's radio calls today oh my gosh me they just sent me like questioning every single move wanting to know like i understand where he's coming from but it's just funny for him to be like well where are we at blah 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 and i'll do this if this gets us for the champion but it just goes to show how important the constructors championship is even if you don't get p1 Like, the difference Mm -hmm. between P2 and P3 is huge, and obviously you want to finish as high as you can. So it was interesting today, I think, to see the most teamwork out of every single race, just being the the final race of the season and and it all coming down to this race. So it's funny to see the teamwork. Yeah. So, so yes, Mercedes got the, they got the extra money for our, and they got the extra money and they also got the, um, the grid, um, the, the pit lane position, um, cause the, the higher up you are, the f- more favorable your pit lane position is. Um, but Ferrari does come away with a very solid amount of money coming out in P3 and also more wind tunnel time for whatever that is worth. Yeah, no, but, um, I, I'm going to, miss george's radio calls over the break he i think he might win my award and we should we should do awards for best radio calls honestly but i think he wins my award for best radio of the year the sweat are you talking about the the sweat solely for the sweat and also just like today too it was just so funny to me but george is coming around on the radio still you know whining i'm thinking he's learning that from lewis but um it, he's really yeah. entertaining to listen to on the radio. 
Oh, I agree. Um, also entertaining to listen to on the radio is, of course, Yuki Sonoda, our favorite Japanese race driver. Um, he had, speaking of radio calls, he had a really nice one with no curse words at the very beginning of the race, thanking Franz Toss for his tenure at Alphatari, which was, that was, that was pretty great. No, it was. And I heard it and I was like, oh, Yuki, that was so nice and like so sweet. And we're so used to hearing or not hearing anything on his radio and just seeing asterisks because yeah. they can't actually, you know, um, televise what he's saying. So it was really nice and sweet to to hear it. And Max also had a really nice, um, you know, end of the race shout out to him as well. And, you know, saying he's been a part of all of our careers. Um yeah, like especially at like, you know, Toro Rosso with he had Max and Danny. And so it's it was yeah. really nice to to see that. Yeah, there was a, a picture that was probably I think it was taken before the race of Franz with Yuki and Daniel and Max and also Pierre together in, in the, the garage because uh, or in the in the paddock, because those are the, the drivers that started their careers with Franz Toss at Alphatari slash Tororosso. Um, so that was that was pretty cool. Yuki, um, he was kind of forced to do a one stop just because he had such great track position with his um best qualifying in his career in P6. Um and unfortunately, you know, the Alphatari is good, but it's not that fast compared to all those cars at the at the top of the grid. So he kind of was forced to do a one stop. He needed to finish P6 or better to get um, Alphatari to overtake Williams and the constructors. Unfortunately, he got P8 and he didn't. We were talking at the end of the race of like, Daniel just needs to overtake Stroll, but there's not enough time. I know. I know. That well, would have and helped. And poor Daniel, too. He had to pit so early because he had something... Stuff he had a tear engine. off in his brake yeah. duct, yeah. Or brake duct, that's what it was, yeah. Um, yeah, not helpful. No, but he. But going back to Yuki, would not have ever had this on my bingo card. He led laps in an F one. Yeah, he five of them. Today. Five whole laps. Which you know, second Japanese driver ever to to lead a race. Yeah, when, it, I think it was what it was like Yuki and Stroll and and Carlos at one point, and people on social media were like, "Stop the race, end it here, red flag it, do not continue, let's keep it this way." <laughs> we're done. Stop oh the God. count. Uh, I love Yuki. I always root for Yuki. He seems you know like a great guy off radio, but um, he. I hope that he has a really good and long career in F1. I really enjoy having him on the grid. Yeah, he's he's a really solid driver. I know that like when when we had all these questions of like, you know, who's going to be in that second Red Bull seat, blah, blah, blah. Um, it was all like, well, what about Yuki going to Red Bull? And I'm like, I don't think Yuki is, is ready for Red Bull yet. Um, but he's definitely ready to take the mantle of lead driver at AlphaTauri to be named whatever next year, um, which was the role that Pierre Gasly had for for a good few, few seasons. And other than in his last season at AlphaTauri, um, he had a pretty good career there. I mean, he he won in an AlphaTauri car um, in what 2020, I think. Um, so it's you know y- Yuki has really stepped into that leadership position, and to have him and Daniel in the cars next year is just going to be like I think AlphaTauri is going to be so much better. I think they're going to be a, a lot higher up in that in that midfield, and I'm really excited to see that. Oh, definitely, definitely, and I think Yuki's just turned a corner. And he's like finding his own now. Cause I mean, I, well, and this is also my problem. I always see Yuki as like a second year driver. I know he's not, but for some reason, yeah. he just seems like he is. Cause he's just like cute little Yuki. Um, but I really think he's finding his groove with the AlphaTauri team now, getting more comfortable after a few seasons. Um, so it's really, really good to see. Yeah, he's also maturing a lot because so that was much. that was one of the the big issues that that was re- one of the big storylines in Drive to Survive was you know he doesn't like to train he loves to eat and those are two things that you like you have to train and you can't just like Yuki is to note is the only driver who's like when I retire I'm gonna open a Michelin star restaurant like that and like that's just typical Yuki um, but as a Formula One driver you you know, you need to, to make sure that you're, you know, watching yourself and you're, you're maintaining your, your weight minimums and your weight maximums for your car. Yeah. No, he, he kills me. 
Ugh. It's but I love it. Going into maybe we've been very positive in this podcast for once. Who are we? Um, but going into a serious negative of the of the weekend, just in general, um, that would be Carlos Sainz. Did not have a good weekend at nope. all. No, that was 0%. kind of a disaster. Kind of a huge disaster. I don't know what's going on with him. Um, last few races, he's really, really struggled, but this was not a good weekend. Crashed in FP2, and then I don't know what strategy Ferrari was running, going hard, hard, and then having to pit, hoping for a safety car. Carlos, even on the radio, was like, so what's our strategy? Because I'm lost, and I have no idea what's going on. Like, this it seems like we don't know what's – well, he didn't say this, but – it seemed like he was calling them out and asking and questioning if they actually knew what was going on. Um, and then he had to pit on the last lap and then just didn't finish. So yep. not a great weekend for him. And I feel like if they would have changed the strategy a little bit, he did start in P15, but he was able to make up sp- like spots and he could have been in the points. I feel like they completely whiffed the strategy Especially with FP2 and the constructors being on the line, it just did not make sense. Again, I'm not a strategist, but this one kind of lost me. I'm not either, but I, I was I was watching something this afternoon, and they they you know with with in Abu Dhabi the overcut the overcut, which means that you wait to pit until the rest of the field is pitted, whereas the undercut is you on is is you pit first. So with the overcut is is not really as powerful in Abu Dhabi because unless you have a fast car, which fortunately Carlos Sainz is driving in a Ferrari and not only that, but a race winning Ferrari. So Carlos had every opportunity to move up, to move into the points, to be battling with Lewis um, for, you know, for position. Um, but you know, um, Ferrari kept him on the, on hards and hards. And then I don't, I don't know why he, he, you know, just bailed off into, into the pit lane instead of crossing the finish line at the end of the race. Usually that happens if there's an issue with the car, but they didn't talk about it because there were other things to talk about. Um, but I, I really, you know, despite the fact that he didn't have a great qualifying, I don't think that he should have been where he finished at the end of the race. No, agreed. It, so dumb. I can't talk about Ferrari's bad strategy one more time. Thank goodness this is the last race of the season because, oh, I I really do hope. Heart, Catherine, it hurts my heart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not that I ever campaign for somebody to lose their job, but I do hope that Fred Vasseur, now that he's going to have a little bit of time in the off season, he does some serious evaluation um, of race strategy in 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 his team um and and that they make some changes because i think that if ferrari wants to be where ferrari should be as one of the top teams in the, on the grid they need to be better at strategy and not leave it to their drivers to make these decisions yeah yeah it's wild wild yeah wild Another thing that was wild and that we kind of talked about how it surprised us is fernando alonso winning the four way Um, P4 battle, again, Mm -hmm. did not ever see this happening just based on how the last few races have gone for um, Aston Martin. But he ended up um, tied with Leclerc on points, but because he had more podiums, he got P4. So it was Alonso P4, Leclerc P5, Norris P6, and Sainz P7, um, which is, you know, good for Alonso. Can we also talk about Lando in P6? Because, you know, Lando had five pit stops in one race in Bahrain back in March. If you would have told me that McLaren would come back to perform the way they did and Norris would end up in P6 after the very first race, when I think they collectively had, what, 175 pit stops? Holy hell. Absolutely not. Norris finishing P6 is so amazing. Yeah, I, I, I did not see that coming. Uh, nobody, like, you expect these cars to develop as the season goes on. Um, but I think if there was one car that really scared Red Bull, it was McLaren. Oh, absolutely. 
Because, like, yes, Charles tried to to get at Max, you know, this weekend at the beginning of the race and also last, you know, last race in Vegas. Um, but I think that the McLaren, if if there was a chance for someone to beat Max purely on pace, I think that the McLaren would have had the better opportunity, except for the fact that Max is, a like we said, a freak of nature. Yeah. And just knows how to get out of everything out of that car. No, I think the standings, both in constructors and drivers, this is nothing close to what I would have predicted at the beginning of the season. No, no. You know, Aston Martin being in, the, in you know, in the midfield after the, the way they started, Mercedes finishing P2, um, AlphaTari getting out of the basement, um, which was basically all credit to Daniel's performance in Mexico. Yeah. Well, and also just even before the very first race, never in a million years would I have predicted that Fernando Alonso would end up on the podium as many times as he did this season. Oh yeah. Eight podiums after, you know, so many years not finishing on the podium. And like, he, like he, he feels like this was, was how he was driving like 10 years ago. Like the, the, the way, you know, he he's 42 years old and he's driving like a 24 year old and yeah. it's amazing to see. I love it. Well, to, to kind of cut ourselves off here, just so we have something to talk about in our, in our season recap. Yeah. Um, let's wrap it up with what seems to be a common thing that we talk about on this podcast contracts seats for your favorite thing my favorite thing to talk about we do have one seat left and that is you know potentially maybe going to logan Sargent for williams um but we still don't know it's still up in the air james voles on the radio this weekend um said he's looking forward to working with him him being logan Sargent over the winter So I think this kind of follows my prediction of we're not going to hear about the seat for a while and it's going to come, you know, in in the break, closer to season start. Um, I don't know if they're going to work with him outside of this season to see where he's at, but um, I don't know. It's not official. They're not coming out and saying, yes, he has a seat, Um, but they were, you know, happy with his progress throughout the season and then James said that something weird that like he's part of the academy and always will be, which makes me feel like he will get the seat. But again, I have no idea. I just I think and, and we talked about this um, before we started recording. I think that he was just covering for the fact that they don't have a contract with him yet because I think that they they had all just you know collectively with Logan Sargent decided that they were going to wait until after season to discuss any of it so whether or not they had you know James Vowles has in his head that they're going to be keeping Logan um like he can't talk about it without a contract so I think that he was just a little bit caught off guard by the the question that came during the post-race show um and so they just need to work out that contract stuff and we will hear about it whenever we hear about it I think that another thing and I've talked about this before is the current you know other front runner for the seat um, is Teo Porcher, who did win the F2 title um, also today. And the runner up in F2, Frederick Vesti, who is a Mercedes driver. I just don't think that Williams is going to go from Logan Sargent as a rookie to Frederick Vesti as a rookie and putting in all the efforts to train him next year when the other option is Logan, who had a pretty decent end to the 2023 season compared to how it started yeah no I don't think I completely agree I don't think they'd go from rookie to rookie to rookie I mean I know Williams is kind of like the feeder team for everybody else that's where you kind of go to start your career but um I still don't think they would keep jumping from rookie to rookie so we will keep you updated whenever news breaks on that um last seat and that last contract but we have our last predictions to go over, Catherine. Last one of yeah. the season. Ah. So, you know, a little bit of hit and miss on these ones. I know everyone, yeah. you know, hates these that we do, but I love them, so we keep doing them. Um, so for poll, we both jumped on the Charles Leclerc train. And unfortunately, Max decided for once, to get Max got this it. weekend. Oh, my God. So we both yeah. missed on that one. Um, but our podium, we were we were pretty good on our podium. So 
the podium at the end of the race was Max, Leclerc, and George. George was not on my radar anywhere whatsoever for this podium. Nowhere. So we both missed P3, but we did both call Max Charles finishing P1, P2, which was good on us. We're getting better at this. Um, and then I think this is a two weeks in a row for me being able to get P10, right? I think so. I, I think so. I am in a, on a hot streak here. Um, so yeah. we had Daniel Ricardo, and I uh, picked Stroll, who did actually end up in P10. So... Go and me. Danny was P. He was P eleven. He fine. was P eleven. So you were very, very close. Yeah. So go us for getting better at selecting our P ten. Um, it's really hard. Yeah. It's so hard. It is so incredibly hard because I feel like towards the the bottom of the points, sometimes it's like you sacrifice so the faster car and the team can go ahead, and it, you know people drop out and whatever. But who knows? Yeah. Maybe next season we'll have to keep track of all of these and see where we're at. And Oh, I'm already thinking about the spreadsheet. I'm already thinking about the spreadsheet. If yes, absolutely. Better, and then we get a trophy. Oh, I love this idea for us. Love, I do too. Love, love. Um, get ready for and it. Then, <laughs> get excited, everybody. Um, and then going into the biggest surprise, Catherine, you said that Mercedes is going to have a very good weekend. They did. They held on to P2 in the championship, so I will give you that one. Um, they have been struggling a little bit in the last few weekends, so them having a you know solid weekend, both cars finishing in the points, I'd say that's a good weekend. I also piggybacked on Mercedes having a good weekend, so we did both check that one. And then I don't think be- Lewis Hamilton would consider this a good weekend, but collectively, effort, team yes. effort. Coll- collectively not, they did and Lewis an no longer sport. yeah and Lewis no longer has to drive the W14 he is done with that car that car he never has to look at it again no happy happy for that I'm really excited to see what their car is like next year just yeah because I feel like they've been making good progress or they say they have and some of their upgrades for this car that came out really did look good so the 2024 car should be interesting yeah um, and last but not least, who's going to do a dumb? Uh, Catherine, I think, once again selected Haas um, to have a disappointing race after a good qualifying. And that happened. Yeah, no, no, no. You you picked Haas to have a to have a bad weekend last week. I picked them to have a good weekend last week. You were Thank right. You I question. was wrong. I then picked Haas to have a disappointing race after a solid qualifying, which was what happened and like I said I really hope that they will have a car that at least performs decently on Sundays um because you know it's it's America it's America's teams and America's until and team. until Andretti comes onto the grid Haas is America's team and so I just I, I want good things for for the American team well that and just for Gunther just and know, for Gunther his book and seeing everything he's done to get a team on on the grid um I can only hope for good things coming from Haas. So, yeah. Um, and then I picked Ferrari. And considering what they did to Carlos for strategy and the fact that, you know, Charles Leclerc was running his own strategy, I would say that I also got that one right. Yeah, yeah. I'll, 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 give, you, I'll give you that one as well. Well, Kevin, do you have any final thoughts from the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix? Not from the 2023 season, because that will be in our season recap episode. But... What are your final yeah. thoughts on this race? Um, my final thoughts on this race were, um, I, I thought that compared to, to the last few races, it was not as, it was, it was really not as exciting. Um, you know, it, it was pretty, it was, it was pretty much one of those standard max starts, max wins type of things, even though we did have a couple of exciting bits. Um, but you know, it was, it was a, it was an exciting ending for the battles that we knew that we were going to be looking forward to. I, I really liked seeing Charles. I, I love when drivers team up with 
drivers that are not on their team. So when we had like Carlos and Lando earlier this year and, you know, Charles working with Checo, I, I love seeing things like that. Um, also a little bit because they were trying to do it against Mercedes, um, which as we know is not my most favorite team. Um, so I, I really enjoyed that. I really hope we get to see more of those kind of like unexpected type team ups as we go um, into next year. Yeah, I definitely think that's something a little newer that we're actually seeing more prominently on the yeah. um, on the circuits, and it was it's always exciting to see things unexpectedly happen. So, um, but no, I like I like your take. Like we were kind of talking about in our DMs before it started, it was like this could be a really exciting race because of all of the you know positions for both constructors and drivers that are kind of up for grabs. Um, and there's still battles going on, but, and there was a little bit of that with Mercedes and Ferrari, but it was also a little bit less action packed than let's say Las Vegas. So yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Well, coming up next, we will have our 2023 season recap episode out next Monday. So we'll only have one episode this week and we are going to move to a weekly episode format. Um, now that the season's over, not as much content. We'll have a lot more F101s coming out and just updates as they come from the um, drivers and from the teams. We have 97 days to Bahrain. Get excited. The countdown is on. The countdown is on. But that has been the podcast. Thanks for going off track with us, guys. <laughs>